Hello, everyone. We're going to get started here. Thank you. Welcome to the Museum of the City of New York. Uh, my name is Kubi Ackerman. I'm the director of the Future City Lab here at the museum. And uh, I'm excited to present the third uh, event in our series, New York's Future on a Changing Climate, uh, which launched last fall and, and uh, which explores the challenges and the opportunities of the Future City Lab, which is part of our ongoing New York at its core exhibition, which explores 400 years of New York City's past, present, and future. The series tonight is presented in honor of Hilary Ballin, who is the curator of the Future City Lab, uh, as well as a number of the most significant exhibitions at the museum over the past decade, uh, and whose legacy we're honoring by presenting uh, these events to expand the public presence of the lab and to leverage the content that we have in the lab um, to inspire deeper conversations on critical issues facing the city in the coming generations. So uh, we're very gratified to be able to present this and the other events in the series in her honor. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment to thank our series sponsor, Saville Studley, uh, who has made all these programs possible, and to thank uh, all our series partners and affiliates, including the New School and Climate Nexus, and you can find a full list of affiliates in your print programs. Uh, so we really appreciate all of their support. I'd also like to let you know that all of the programs in this series are being recorded and will air on public access television on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and uh, the event tonight will air on Sunday, February 25th at 9 p.m., Wednesday, February 28th at 8 p.m., and Friday, March 2nd at 4 p.m., and will also be available online on our website. So for tonight's edition of the series, uh, Liquid Assets, New York's Watersheds and Waterways, we're going to welcome five distinguished speakers who will discuss water, which is uh, essential to all life, uh, as well as forming the very basis for the existence of the city, established as it was on a sheltered uh, deep water harbor, which was really the, the nexus of the city's development into a global metropolis. Uh, and while it might seem a little bit odd or imprecise to conflate the city's watershed, which is the area of almost 2,000 square miles uh, which, uh, from which uh, our water is collected and transported into our municipal water supply, with our waterways, which is the tidal estuary and the rivers that surround our almost 520 miles of coastline, which make us a coastal city, um, they're all really part of the same system because almost all the water that falls into our watershed eventually makes its way into our waterways, often along with uh, sewage and all manner of other pollutants. Uh, but more importantly, uh, both our watershed and our waterways provide us with the opportunity to consider New York City in its larger geographic and environmental context, um, dependent as it is on regional communities and regional climate for its drinking water and, uh, and obviously subject to global climate shifts, which will affect both the water supply and more pressingly our coastal areas, which are projected uh, by 2050. Uh, it's, it's projected that uh, almost a quarter of the city's land will be in the flood zone. Um, and of course, these challenges impact different parts of the city and different communities in the city in very different ways. And so, uh, and we're very fortunate to have with us tonight some of the most qualified people in New York to help us unpack some of these important issues. Uh, I'd also like to invite you to join us for the next event in this series, which is Feeding the Apple, which will be a conversation between celebrated chef Dan Barber and New York Times reporter Julia Moskin on the future of food. So they'll be discussing um, uh, how we can transition into more uh, sustainable and equitable food system and what some, some of the most thought-provoking and provocative ideas for the future of food uh, in New York are. Uh, that event will take place on Wednesday, April 18th at 6.30 here at the museum, and you can register online at mcny.org forward slash future. So we hope to see you there. I would now like to introduce our moderator and our panelists. So our moderator is New York Times columnist Jim Dwyer, uh, who has spent most of his professional life covering the city as a reporter, a columnist, and author. He joined the Times in 2001 and has written the About New York column since 2007. Uh, he's the winner of the 1995 Pulitzer Prize for Commentary and a co-recipient of the 1992 Pulitzer for Breaking News, as well as the author and co-author of six books. And he'll be joined by our panelists, uh, Al Appleton, uh, International Environmental and Infrastructure Consultant and Senior Fellow at the Cooper Union Institute for Sustainable Design, Adjunct Associate Professor at the Cooper Union, and previous Commissioner of the City's Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, Eddie Bautista, the Executive Director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance and previously uh, Director of the Mayor's Office of City Legislative Affairs. Uh, Paul Gallet, the President of Riverkeeper. Uh, and Stacey Levy, an environmental artist. Uh, so uh, please join me in welcoming them all to the stage. Hi, my name is Jim Dwyer and I'm here with Paul Gallet. Eddie Bautista, Stacy Levy, and Al Appleton. I had a boss one time who was uh, doing home repairs, and uh, 
one day he, he called me into his office. There had been a water main break in Carroll Gardens just a couple of days earlier. This was uh, January of 1994. And it was unbelievably disruptive. There was streets, homes flooded, electricity out, all kinds of problems. And my boss, Don Force, you know, it was a big deal that this water main that had broken was so old. It was 137 years old. And because he was in the middle of home renovations, he was in awe. He said, find out who the contractor was <laughs> who put those pipes in. So I did. The Brooklyn Water Works Company had an annual report I went to it for 1859, and it turned out there was a guy named John Rhodes who went all over the Northeast to the foundries where they were casting these pipes. And John Rhodes broke their chops like nobody's business. Every single piece of pipe that came out, he hit with a hammer to make sure it rang true. And I, if you don't mind my just peeking at this phone, I have some of the language uh, that, that he, he, he wrote. Um, on 5th of November, 1857, I proceeded to the Warren Foundry and Machine Company, Rhodes wrote. The proportion of good pipes was so small as to create no inconsiderable excitement towards myself and very great apprehension among the stockholders of the, of the company. And th on that first day, uh, three rounds of pipes, 62 accepted, rejected 45. 19 accepted, rejected 34. Accepted seven, rejected 17. There isn't a single mention of John Rhodes anywhere online that I can find or in the history books. But New York exists today because of people like John Rhodes. And in the late 1830s, there was a good question about whether Manhattan Island would still be habitable in the coming years. The famous Collect Pond, which is down by Foley Square, maybe some of you have seen the Collect Pond park that's there now, uh, once I think covered 40 acres and was surrounded by forest and all that. And, uh, but by the early 19th century, it had, and it had been the original great source of water for uh, pre-19th century New York, but it had been completely fouled with sewage, with industrial, there was tanneries that were throwing their hides in there and their mercury and whatever else they were doing. And it really was a very bad shortage of water, even though this island was alive with water, completely burbling with water. But they were, all the waterways were being used basically as sewage uh, ways. We needed fresh water, or they, but we, their heirs, needed it too. We just didn't know it yet. And into this uh, came um, an engineer whose name is going to come right back to me. <laughs> John B. Jervis. And he dammed up the Croton River in Westchester. And about 40 miles north was this big reservoir. And he had to get it to Manhattan. So he brought it in great water mains, 40 miles, very gently sloping, 13 and a quarter inches decline for every mile, crossing the Harlem River at the High Bridge, then going down the center of Manhattan, and ultimately, on gravity alone, reaching City Hall Park and the day they turned on the fountain down there in 1842, there were three presidents of the United States on hand to watch this incredible feat. 
The geyser of water rose 50 feet in the air on pure gravity, having traveled 50 miles, more than that. This was gravity's own geyser. There's a lot to say about water. <laughs> Al Appleton is one of the John Rhodes of our era. He worked uh, in the city government uh, for two stints, once with Mayor Lindsay and once under Mayor Dinkins as the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection. The Department of Environmental Protection brings the water into the city and then gets it out because it's got to, what comes in must go out. And Al, when you left government in 1993 at the end of Mayor Dinkins' term, uh, there were about seven and a quarter, seven and a half million people. Today, there's eight and a half million. We gonna have enough water for them when it keeps growing? Before I answer Jim's question, I wanted to I pass on one little anecdote inspired by his recollection of the water fountain. The reason brownstones are five stories in New York is because five stories was the height to which the gravity flow would reliably lift the water. That is, you could get it maybe six or seven stories if you're lucky, but five was the height. So the water system really is kind of the architectural facts shaping you know, the side streets of the city and all of the brownstones. Now, we actually are in a particularly beneficial water system. We use today 400 million gallons less of water than we used back when we had 7.6 million people in the city, and we, are, and we still have some conservation potential left. That I'd say in terms of the many global cities I've looked at, New York City is the best position to ride out global warming in terms of water supply. I mean, the waterways are a different story, as we will hear and see in some of the memos. Um, we are, we are in good shape water-wise. We have a 200 million gallon a day surplus um, that, we can, that we can ride on and global warming is going to increase precipitation in the New York area. So we're not facing some of the droughts cities like Cape Town are facing, um, which maybe we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about later. So the water system in New York is an incredible asset. Um, it's been estimated to be worth $50 billion, which means our watershed, of course, is a $50 billion source of revenue. Um, and the other thing I would just say is the city community in New York has always risen to protect the water system. I mean, it was a great civic vision that we originally created the Croton water system, <laughs> the great civic vision that expanded it. In every one of these debates, there were proposals to do it cheaply, to do it for patronage reasons. Um, and the city gave the back of the hand to them, including in the 1990s when we chose to do environmental strategies to save the water system rather than construction strategies. And it's a great story of civic achievement, the water system. And it's a civic achievement we will live on for the future. And I'm proud to have been a part of it. Jim. Well, thank you. One of the great enemies of the city uh, before we had a reliable fresh water system was called Vibrio cholerae, cholera. It killed 3,500 people in the 1830s during one year of epidemic. And it was the first recorded instance of white flight in the history of the city. What the city was shrinking. The affluent people were going out to New Jersey and Westchester where there was reliable and fresh water and left behind were immigrants and Africans. What, Eddie? <laughs> I get the cholera question, I yeah. love it. <laughs> yeah, okay. What, what, what do you do without a modium? You know? uh, uh, no, what, in, environmental justice Today, we think everybody has it because everybody can turn on a tap and, and get good water out of it. And that is, of course, a great force in our city and allows people to, you, know, you don't have to move to Westchester to get a drink of water. 
But there's a lot of other challenges out there. And can you talk about some of that for us? Sure. Um, so I, I work with a citywide coalition of uh, community-based groups from the city's most environmentally overburdened communities. Um, and in fact, um, in terms of our experience with, with water, I, I was going to actually take a, a leap from John Rhodes and cholera into the future, if I'm allowed. Um, so a lot of our work over the years has had to do with infrastructure, like some of the, uh, uh, you know, not all, but a predominance of the city's kind of infrastructure, including sewage treatment plants, uh, are disproportionately located in low-income communities of color. So th there's been a lot of activism over the years to make sure that, uh, and in fact, I think some of it coincided with some of the infrastructure upgrades over the last 25 years. So you have a new town creek so a treatment plant that one wouldn't have recognized 30 years ago, right? Um, uh, and a lot of it had to do with the partnership between community and city, making sure that uh, that it was it, that, that it did more than just the bare minimum we expect of our sewage treatment plants. Um, but if you look at, for example, our combined sewer overflows, our CSOs, um, uh, over 70 percent of P of New Yorkers that live within, say, a half a mile of CSOs are people of color, right? So. Um, but let me take a, a step forward in terms of how we came at the, the, our most recent um, waterfront advocacy, which has to do with climate change and, and storm surge resiliency. Yeah. Before you get there, sure. could I just ask you to explain the combined sewer overflow system, just, to, just for some folks who might be not understand what it is? Gotcha. So, so New York and, and a lot of northeastern cities are uh, cities that combine our sewer functions, right? So both our uh, when it rains a lot, um, it goes to the sewers, as well as when we go to the bathroom, it goes to the same. So it's a combined, literally combined sewer overflow. Um, I'm not doing, I'm not giving proper poetry to it, like Al or, or Paul can, but essentially we have a combined sewer system. So when it rains a lot, uh, it overwhelms the sewage treatment plants, and we have incidences where you have still raw sewage pouring into the city's waterways. Um, so, uh, but jumping for ahead for a second in terms of how climate change and uh, storm surges, um, you know, are new threats for us in terms of water quality. Um, I have to back up to, again, the 90s. Um, back in the 90s, New York City updated its coastal zone management plan. It's called the uh, Waterfront Revitalization Program. And there was an introduction of, uh, and the waterfront revitalization program basically divvies up the kinds of activities that are allowed on our waterfronts, right? There was an introduction of a new um, category called significant maritime and industrial areas in the 90s where a lot of us were concerned because there was certain environmental protections that um, under the Giuliani administration were lowered in these what are known as SMIAs. And, and I'm going to forward to a, a slide in a second to show you where they are. Um, but you know, in the 90s when we saw this happening, we, you know, we tried to launch a campaign to get uh, the Giuliani administration to understand that this was actually an issue of environmental justice because of the uh, disproportionality of communities of color uh, and their vulnerability to these, to these exposures. Uh, but you know, it, was, it was the Giuliani years and about the only thing that they were more hostile to than environmental protection was civil rights and we were combining the two and it, it, they just wasn't having it, right? So fast forward to 2010, Bloomberg, uh, the Bloomberg administration starts looking at re, uh, overhauling the coastal zone management plan again. And in 2010, we, we get another bite at the apple. And we say, okay, what, what do we have to do to kind of re, you know, reintroduce these protections? But what we had in 2010 that we didn't have in the 90s was uh, climate change uh, analytical tools. So what we did was an overlay of, so as you can see, the six uh, SMIAs from top to bottom is the South Bronx, Newtown Creek, Brooklyn Navy Yard, Red Hook, Sunset Park, and North Shore of Staten Island. What the orange that you see is an overlay of storm surge projections from the uh, New York State Office of Emergency Management. And they're called significant maritime industrial areas because that's where the last remaining heavy clusters of chemical uses, industrial uh, uh, uses, uh, infrastructure, Th and these are designed to be where, you know, the city kind of, you know, uh, clusters these uses. But what we didn't know when we started, when we designed the city was that we would be looking at storm surges, right? So we were all of a sudden worried that every single one of these SMIAs were vulnerable to storm surges. And we're talking, forget category one or two, we're talking, you know, a nor'easter, a heavy rain. We, we've seen flooding in these communities. 
So we started doing mapping and we started looking at all the databases and we started seeing the kinds of chemicals that are used. And we're not talking about nefarious, I mean a print shop. Like people just opened up their business in these places because that's where they're zoned, never expecting that the East River would go roaring one day through their print shops, right? So you've got businesses that use uh, you know, cadmium, mercury, you know, a host of really toxic chemicals, right? And just to give you an example of why you should care, right, if you don't live in these neighborhoods, um, this is a, a close-up of one of these SMIAs. This is the South Bronx Significant Maritime Industrial Area. The dots that you see are just four data sets that we mapped. Uh, New York State Office, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation's brownfields permits, uh, bulk storage units for oil, uh, land-based waste transfer stations. These are just like five of them, right? As you can see, they're all within the orange, right, which is where there are storm surge projections. The shaded area at the top is the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center, right? When Sandy struck, now that body of water around the South Bronx SMIA is the Long Island Sound. When Sandy struck, it was about 12 hours off, like it was low tide, right? Had Sandy struck 12 hours on one side or another, the mayor's office has confirmed that the, that the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center, which feeds 23 million people, it's the largest food distribution center in the United States, second largest in the world, this would have been overrun. And the mayor's office could not tell us for how long New Yorkers food supply would have been interrupted, right? If you guys remember how nasty the gas line fights were, I mean, people were ready to pull guns over. Try interrupting New Yorkers food supply for a couple of days, right? So, and, and again, it's a, it's a food distribution center surrounded by heavy chemical uses, right? It, we, we did a preliminary uh, analysis and something like 622,000 New Yorkers live within a half a mile of these SMIAs. It's about the population of Washington, D.C., right? Of those 622,000, 433,000 are people of color. So, and, and there, are, there are a variety of different kind of data sets that we could show, but this is one that for us has become uh, a clear and present danger. We've been doing a lot of coastal resiliency advocacy um, in the event of, you know, c can we find ways to make these waterfronts more resilient without driving out the industry because we consider ourselves industrial retention advocates. So it's a real kind of wicked problem. How do we retain these uses but make them more resilient in a time of climate change? So this is like a water quality problem that, you know, that's why we want to bring Al back so he can figure out like how to do that. Thanks, Eddie. Um, The uh, um, governor of New York, once upon a time, made the following statement. The river from Troy to the south of Albany is one great septic tank that has been rendered useless for water supply, for swimming, or to support the rich fish life that once abounded there. And that governor was Nelson Rockefeller, and he was speaking in 1965. Paul has worked for the state and Environmental Protection Agency, and he's now the head of Riverkeeper, which has been a ferocious advocate for quality of the Hudson and the restoration of other waterways and the protection of others. What would Rockefeller say today about the Hudson, Paul? He would say he does not recognize it, and he has no idea how it got the way it is today. And the, answer, the answers are several. The answers are the Clean Water Act of 1972. The answers are the amazing investments made in city water quality under uh, then DEP Commissioner Al Appleton, who I had the great pleasure to work with when I was at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. He'd say those damn environmental groups like uh, Riverkeeper and Clearwater and Scenic Hudson that brought the first cases back in the 60s. Uh, and he'd say the increase in the number of people who look out at the river instead of away from the river, because as those of you who are students of city history know, 
the waterfronts are now owned by the residents of New York for the first time. It was the maritime industry during the break bulk era that owned the waterfronts before the last several decades. The idea that Riverkeeper, my organization, after 50 years of work, has been able to convince the state of New York and uh, the state of New York uh, Department of Environmental Conservation is now run by Basil Sagos. Basil Sagos was at Riverkeeper when I was at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. So every once in a while we get on the phone and we practice one another's lines. <laughs> the idea that the state of New York has mandated that all the waterways in New York City be acceptable in terms of their quality, their bacteria levels, their levels of other contaminants, for swimming, for what they call primary contact recreation, 24-7, 365, that that's the standard the city is now being forced to live up to. They're not there yet. It will be billions of dollars and decades before they are. But the fact that that's the standard that the city now has to reach is something that we could not have imagined as recently as 1990 when I first walked through the doors of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Office in Long Island City. So uh, Governor Rockefeller would say, I do not recognize this river, but I like what I see. It's not that easy to see, but you can see that there is a line in the middle of the Hudson up in the area around Kingston uh, where the lower Esopus comes out into the Hudson full of brown gunk, which it does after heavy rains because the city sometimes uses the Hudson as its storm sewer for its water supply. This is one of the reasons why we're looking to balance the interests of New York City water drinkers with the interests of our friends, the critters, uh, in having a healthy river in which to team. Hey, Paul, could I just interrupt you for a second? When you say the city, what, what does the city have to do with water up around Kingston? Well, the city's water reservoirs, and Al, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there are at least a dozen. Six. Six on the west side, 12 in the Croton system. Yeah. So uh, on the uh, west side of the Hudson, where most of the water comes from and the unfiltered water is located, some of the largest reservoirs uh, in the system are located, such as the Ashokan Reservoir, which is up between Kingston and Woodstock. And when it rains, a lot of uh, turbidity is washed into that reservoir as erosion from stream corridors. And the city likes to shunt that turbidity away from the reservoir so we all get clean water as we have here. And unfortunately, sometimes it's the Hudson that bears the brunt. So the next slide is uh, what we do to keep the city and state honest. We test uh, about um, 400 locations a year for uh, clarity, for dissolved oxygen, which if you're a fish is uh, like what we depend upon here in this room with the oxygen here. Uh, and also for bacteria, which of course is something you don't want to be coming into contact with either if you're drinking or if you're swimming. Uh, 5,000 data points a year. It uh, helped drive a citizen's right to know law where bacteria contamination in our rivers and waterways around the state must be disclosed to the public within two hours. It's like what used to be called the ozone alerts. You can get them on your phone. And uh, it also drove in the last three years $2.9 billion in water infrastructure investment spending. And so this is very valuable, the citizen science sampling. We have about 180 people who help us with this. And finally, uh, the biggest threat to the Hudson, and one that's been a huge driver of public activism upon which Riverkeeper really depends more than anything else except for possibly the courts, is the issue associated with crude oil shipments up and down the Hudson since in 2015 uh, the um, federal government in its infinite wisdom decided to allow exports of crude oil and they have uh, increased by a factor of 300% since then. You have the bomb trains, and you have uh, tankers. This is the happier slide, so I'll end on the happier slide. It's always a good idea. When we are done cleaning up all the contamination, when we've spent the additional billions to remove the combined sewer overflows, when we've undone all of the historic hazardous waste sites like Newtown Creek, we're going to have cleaner water and cleaner water fronts, but what are we going to do in them? So we're trying to create visions, whether it's Newtown Creek or Flushing Creek, Flushing Bay, 
And what you see up there, and if, if you had extremely good eyes, you can see that we're looking for pocket parks. We're looking for places where people can get down to the river. We're looking for wetlands that can be created to enhance uh, flyovers for birds, can store rainwater in the case of those terrible storms that uh, we've all suffered through. And so a vision for the future that's not just remedied of past contamination, but also has resilience, recreation, and restoration. So that's what we're about at Riverkeeper. Up until very recently, there were um, pumps that had been bought secondhand for the New York City subway system. And they were involved in pumping out water uh, on the IRT line, which those of you who have been around for a while knows stands for Irish Rapid Transit. <laughs> uh, it's the four, the five, the six, the one, and the two, and the three. Um, <clears throat> but those pumps were bought by a guy named Colonel Parsons. Parsons was the engineer who oversaw the construction of the Panama Canal. And once he got done designing the IRT, he needed, uh, he realized that there were scores and scores of streams that, even though we couldn't see them, were still underground. And today, the subway system pumps out 13 million gallons of water a day. And that's just from the water table. You know, that's just the, the ordinary streams that end up when the state office building on 125th Street was constructed, the foundation displaced the stream and they, uh, they ended up having to build 400 well points to collect the water and send it into the sewer system. So one of the most magical things I've heard about in the last few years was a project that I consider like a doctor palpating your veins. You know when you get a, a shot and they want to get a vein, they tap on your arm. And uh, Stacy Levy is an artist who is extremely inventive and brought a group and has brought groups around the city several times to find those underground streams to palpate the sidewalk and uh, paint, or chalk, well, tell, tell us about it. Um, you may wonder what an artist might be doing on a panel about water, but um, showing the water to people is an extremely important part of the citizens having a vision of what's falling and what's soaking in and where it's flowing. And without that, sense of the water, you lose track of why you need it and not, why you worry about it until there's an emergency. So in some ways, um, though artists can handle emergencies, we also handle the celebration of urban water and make people feel good about it. We're not living in Phoenix, in the kitty litter kind of landscape of Phoenix or other dry <laughs> places. We live in a place that's bestowed with an extraordinary liquid asset, hence the title of this panel which is a yard of rain a year, increasing probably um, with climate change. Um, it comes fairly regularly, which is great. It doesn't come in a monsoon once or twice a year. And it's really an extraordinary thing that we don't really like to live with. So one of the roles that artists can play is talking about uh, what this rain does and where it goes and um, what you can't see normally as you're walking down your gridded street. I think one of the very wonderful things about cities, particularly older cities that have a fair bit of rain and so have watersheds that are still alive under the urban grid. And this idea that you can be on the grid and there's water underneath is an extraordinary sense of connection to the natural world and a kind of vertigo of, of time, where we have this present day of very perpendicular streets and this past of a dendritic system that's alive and still pumping under, under our, our urban grid. And that kind of sense of connection through time to nature 
is powerful and gives us a great, a different sense about our city. It's not just us as we're walking down the street. It's not just our structure. There's actually a whole natural force going on. And I think that's a, an important thing to be connected to. And becoming even more important as, you know, like knowing the past and how it can influence your future, these past streams that have been put underground are often rising up in places, particularly with storm surges, and become the maps for how we understand how wet we're going to be in the future. So we need to look to these past uh, tributaries and get a sense of how they function, way, where they flow, and how they're connected to our neighborhood and, and how we use our neighborhoods too. This is such an incredibly great topic. I would love to sit here and take a course from the four of you. Um, Al, could you talk about the, uh, the project of the, your years as the environmental commissioner, what you call the environmental solution or the environmental development as opposed to the construction development? Could you just explain that? I don't think necessarily a lot of the world knows how important that has been to our city. Well, in the early 1990s, <clears throat> New York City faced a number of problems. It's a traditional water solution was to build something new. One of the problems was that we were running out of water. We'd had four drought events in 10 years. We'd had, um, we were 200 million gallons a day below what is called safe limit, which is the amount you can rely upon under the worst possible conditions. Um, our watershed was being attacked by industrial agriculture and second family homes. We have an unfiltered watershed. We're one of the great cities of the world and one of the reasons our water is so good is because it is not chemically treated except with chlorine and a few things we put in to get it through the water system bacteria free. Um, there were places like Staten Island where we were suffering from problems of flood water and storm water and again the traditional solution was to build a lot of things, but we were already building so much, and this was an environmental justice issue, a big one at the time, that the water rates had been going up over 10% a year for seven years, and that they were threatening the budgets of the affordable housing, which as those of you who know, are based on very narrow calculations of cash flow and profitability. So basically, it seemed to me, um, and I used to have some wonderful friends in the Catskills and would go up to the Catskills and look at the one. And it seemed to me really stupid to allow things to get polluted, get ruined, and then spend billions of dollars coming up with a solution. And I thought we ought to investigate the idea, what do we spend some part of that billion dollars on protecting the environment rather than exploiting it and then trying to clean it up afterwards. So we created, uh, among, to protect the watershed, we created a partnership with the local farmers and local residents and become a worldwide model for watershed protection. Um, I'm now working in places like Bogota to uh, see if we can replicate the success of New York City in protecting its watershed. We did a water conservation program. Instead of uh, wasting water, that say 400, that we now, with a city of about a million more people, use 400 million gallons of water less than we used in 1990. And we've not had a drought event since 1991 um, in terms of this. And as I said at the start, we have a water surplus that is huge and is going to you know, buffer the city against global warming. On Staten Island, we saved the wetland areas and we stopped the local flooding. Um, on Jamaica Bay, we developed a plan um, for essentially dealing with the fact that much of the pollution problem in Jamaica Bay is caused by the artificial contours of the bay, and the bay should be filled in and shallowed, which is what it was historically, so nature can flush out the pollution. Basically, this is now, we, this is now called green infrastructure, natural infrastructure, and we in the city pioneered it. And many of the solutions to things like CSO are in it, although I have some, uh, I tend to think that sometimes people tend to look at natural infrastructure as a magic bullet. Water systems, after all, are constructed entities. Without reservoirs, without pipe distributions, you wouldn't have a water system, and you wouldn't be able to do it. But the, it's very interesting. When I consult overseas, 
people often and talk about these ideas, people often say, well, those are great ideas, but you know, New York's a very rich city. We're a poor community. And so I asked the audience, um, how many people here have seen Gangs of New York? <laughs> and it's amazing how many people who are seen have seen the movie Gangs of New York. So I remind them of the scene where they were fighting over the water hydrant. Because one of the things you have with a water system is it's there for fire protection as well as for disease prevention and for drinking water. And I said, that's the city that built the water system that we're talking about. These are the kinds of things that if you do smart public investment and smart public management, you can afford. You can always afford to do the right thing. One of the things I remember the Giuliani people once told me, real men don't talk about the environment. <laughs> So to which I said, well, you know, real men talk about money. <laughs> and using the environment saved the city of New York. We ended, our, we ended the runaway water rates. We saved like $10 billion in capital construction. And the, when the Giuliani people went and blew $3 billion on Newtown Creek, which was the dumbest project in the history of construction in the city. And, <laughs> And, but people pay for that out of their pockets when you make these kinds of mistakes and you don't take the, you know, the smart solution, the best solution. So I think, and I think when we come to deal with CSOs, we're going to have to deal with some smart solutions. And I'm not convinced that we're dealing with the smartest possible solutions yet. The, but that's a, long, that's a kind of sidebar discussion we can have if you want. But the critical thing is, Nature provides us with this wonderful resource. When you talk to worldwide watershed experts, the idea is now the idea we pioneered in New York, which is to manage the watershed nature's way, which is to understand that the best way to get good water is to have good environment. When I was dealing with Paul, not Paul personally, but Paul and his regulators, the regulators wanted us to go into the watershed and shoot at, here's a problem, there's a problem, let's throw a little program here, that's a little project. We did not do that in the New York City watershed. The New York City watershed is based on providing a good environment that would give you good water. And that's what we do. And that's the issue. Yeah. Well, all right, well, enough of the success stories. <laughs> um, the Regional Plan Association comes out with a big, uh, massive plan about everything that's going on in the metropolitan area and what ought to be, what they think ought to be done. So I was getting a little presentation on this a couple months ago, and uh, one page flew by, and it was the Hackensack Meadowlands area and Teterboro Airport, and it said, we don't think any infrastructure investments with a life beyond 25 years should be put into Teterboro Airport because we think that place is gonna be un underwater more or less permanently and there's not a hope in hell of stopping it. So we have, uh, of course, as a coastal city, uh, hundreds of miles of coastline and people living right on the edge. And for a long time, uh, poor people were getting the waterfront property because it was the crummiest around. And uh, what are, I mean, we have so many things we got to think about with, with the rising water tables and the infiltration of the tides and so forth. So, yeah, Al, go for it. Well, the, 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 the people that are living in abject denial about what global warming means, and I mean serious denial, the, the, the chemical figures Eddie was talking about are replicated across the country. There was a recent study that showed that there's something like 20,000 chemical facilities in flood zones. Um, you know, if you look at the response to Sandy, the city and the state just blundered around. Um, it was kind of flavor of the month. Everyone's pet idea became an answer to Sandy, and that was how we were going to sell it. There is no coherent planning about RP is right. We should not be building apartments in flood zones in the Rockaways. We should not be siting important infrastructure and transportation infrastructure in areas. That, unless we do something significant about global warming, will we'll be underwater. Um, it, it's simple mathematics. The, if all the ice in the earth melted and all the ice in the world is on track to melt over the next 150 years, if you get thermal expansion of the oceans, you're looking at 250 feet of ocean rise. 
Now all we need is about six to swamp one quarter of New York. Um, all of the storm outlets are three and a half feet above mean sea level. So if you get something, you're gonna get backed up storm sewers all over the city of New York. That's the kind of, th we have infrastructure in flood zones, we have pumping stations, we have outfalls. Um, we are not ready. Sandy should have been a wake up call, but it wasn't. Because basically we got bogged down in the issue of what are we gonna do about rebuilding in the coastal zone? And that's a complicated problem. It's a complicated problem for communities that already exist. It's not a complicated problem for future construction. We shouldn't be building there. End of story. Um, we're, New York is projected, if we get another Sandy event with ocean rise, to have $200 billion of flood damage. That is the third highest city in the world, behind Miami and Guangzhou in China. Um, the, but people don't want to face these realities. The real estate industry wants its views of the harbor. Um, the communities that you know, want to pretend that this won't happen again or somehow we're going to rebuild it, the federal flood insurance program is already um, incredible. We, we, we lost $95 billion this year in global warming related storm events. We could have done an awful lot of interesting things with that $95 billion. But until we have a coherent strategy for dealing with what we're gonna put in the flood zone, we're doomed. Um, we're gonna waste tens and tens of billions of dollars. The other thing I have to say is New York City and New York State together have the wimpiest global warming energy policy um, that kind of exists on the planet. But that, I'll just toss that out as a teaser. Wow. <laughs> there comes the hand grenade, huh? Cool. So, uh, listen, there's, there's only so much reality people can handle without having a sense of the possibilities for making a difference about it. We have more reality than we can handle on this issue by a factor of 10. So we better figure out how to change that math. We better figure out how to activate. I mean, who ever heard of a standing room only crowd talking about water resource management on a rainy Thursday night? Apparently this is a much more sexy issue than I ever thought it to be. <laughs> we have thousands of people who commented on those bomb trains that I showed you. We had 250,000 people who commented on fracking regulations in New York State. The Coast Guard never saw 10,000 uh, comments on anything that they proposed when the anchorages came out. And the DEC never saw 250,000 comments on the fracking regs. And the last I looked, fracking is not happening in New York. And yes, you can applaud now. <laughs> and, and while we're on the topic of things where change that did not seem possible previously, that reality seemed to just have us polaxed, Indian Point Nuclear Plant, which is long past its expiration date, is closing in two years, and whoever saw that as happening, this plant is increasingly dangerous, and it's gonna put more pressure on us to cite renewable energy. We can't solve the carbon loading problem by ourselves, but we are one of the richest cities in one of the richest countries in the world, and if we're not doing it, who is going to? If we're not setting examples for citizen action, keeping fossil fuels in the ground, moving to renewable energy, who's gonna do that? So if, if each of you tells two people, and they each tell two people, really, citizen activism is, in the words of Margaret Mead, the only thing that changes the world. It has to be thoughtful and dedicated. So thoughtful, dedicated action is the only hope we have. Yes, but I want to mention one thing about Indian Point. Having been launched one of the first safety proceedings in 1982 with New York City Ottoman State, Indian Point is great. There are four nuclear plants upstate that the governor- Great proposed. that we're closing it or great because you want it to stay open? No, it's great because it's closing. But- uh, We got more to go. I, I didn't spend a lot of effort in 1982 trying to keep it open, I can assure you. <laughs> Nevertheless, we got four nuclear plants upstate. The state of New York proposes to spend $8 billion, $8 billion of your money subsidizing their continued operation. Right. That $8 billion could pay for much of the green energy system Paul is talking about. So we, the, so the point about Indian Point is not that it was a great victory, but it should have been the start of a great victory, but essentially the state of New York is ignoring the message that they should have gotten from Indian Point, and we're gonna waste a lot of money 
that we should be spending on you know trying to slow down global warming. And just to make a quick point about the, the co-benefits of, of green infrastructure, uh, by the way, after Sandy, uh, the mayor's office confirmed that about half of the um, uh, about half of the industrial firms that were impacted by Sandy along the Brooklyn Queens waterfronts were industrial firms. Right? Uh, there, there were there were a couple of spills at power plants. To, to my knowledge, there was no assessment done afterwards about any potential exposures. In fact, one of the things that we learned after the fact was, uh, especially in environmental justice communities with a lot of brownfields and Superfund sites, was uh, we wanted to get a sense, well, you know, with, with around Newtown Creek, Superfund site, with, with, was there any contamination as a result of it? And what we were told was, well, you needed to do pre-event testing of your local uh, land because we don't know if the pollution was created by Sandy or if your neighbor was already so screwed up it was already polluted. So like we, we, we were in this kind of odd place and we have to determine just how screwed up we are to then find out how screwed we got after the event. But, but in terms of the green infrastructure piece, people keep forgetting that the storm surge stuff is, is what is the is the sexier, that's not even the right word, but it, it gets all the attention when, it talks, when we talk about climate change because it's so dramatic, right? It, it happens, you can count the kind of people that, that, that get killed as a result of it, but more people die because of heat waves every year. Then, and what's interesting about, about uh, green infrastructure is that it provides co-benefits. Co it can help us in key parts of the waterfront in terms of storm surge project, projection. It can also help us with urban heat island effect, right? What people don't know is that right now, if you look at the number of people that die every year from heat-related deaths, it's about 150. This is based on, 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 on city numbers, right? And I've seen two reports with two different sets of numbers, so we're trying to get to the bottom of that. But by the 2050s, we're hearing that the number of 90-degree days are expected to double, the number of heat waves are expected to triple and quadruple. So, you know, we, we, there's a lack of urgency and seriousness to, and, and there's a way of doing both. There's a way of, with a green infrastructure robust campaign, taking care of storm surge, water quality, and the urban heat island effect. But I'm with Al, like there is a lack of urgency that I find like frightening at this point. But. Like well, on I, that happy note. I heard someone take a swipe at Phoenix, which is where my brother lives and is a very successful cardiologist. But in Phoenix, if you go to, f at the height of the day, nobody's on the streets. Right. They're cuddled up to their air conditioners because they active. You want to play tennis, you play it at 11 at night. There are some interesting projections about what is going to happen to cities who have X amount of 90 degree days because your body depends on sweating at 98.6 degrees, if, it's very hard for your body to lose heat in a 110 degree environment. And it is going to render many cities potentially uninhabitable. Or only inhabited at night. In the right. Few, right. <laughs> or, and spending, of course, a ton of, of money and energy on air conditioning. Yeah. yeah. Stacy, uh, in, in your work, uh, the, the the reality or the looming realities or how does that emerge in your in your projects? Well, one of, one of the things that um, I'm always working on is the idea that a lot of the prevention is about looking after nature and keeping more of it. Keeping you were speaking about these bands that you need of nature to function in such a way to absorb water, to take the storm surge, not to allow erosion, are really important pieces of these kind of remnant natural pieces that we need to learn to respect and to enjoy. And um, we've not really been, um, our minds have not, I've always sort of thought about pristine nature, and we need to learn to love urban nature with all its detriments, and there will be plastic bags caught in it, and, um, but it's still the nature that we have. And one of the things that's very important is to know that transitional natural areas are going to be the most essential natural areas for us, places that um, can take the storm surge 
places that can infiltrate the storm water coming down. So there's water coming down from the city, there's water coming in from the, the um, waterways, the larger waterways. Some kind of landscape needs to be the in-between absorber of all of those kind of um, natural and unnatural phenomenon. And so we really need to embrace a soggy landscape, a landscape that can get wet and stay wet for a while and then slowly dry out. And that's the kind of place in urban nature that we need to make people feel like that's a good thing, not a sort of yucky area in the backyard that they want to drain or fill. So this new kind of landscape that's going to come out of um, resilience is about the transitional landscape, the soggy, mushy kind of places. And I think that my job is trying to get people to love those sort of places. Okay, folks, in, a, in another sec minute or so, we're going to take some questions. Uh, it'll be a Q&A session, so remember your part is the Q. <laughs> okay, and Paul's got uh, a couple of things to say. So, But meanwhile, tee up the questions in your head. So we're talking about the New York City watershed, and the New York City watershed is one of the truly most in, in, well-engineered and well cared for water systems in the world. There are another nine million people in New York drinking the rest of the water. And Riverkeeper for a long time was only focused on the New York City drinking water. I want us all to realize that we need to be focused on the entire drinking water system. And I was earlier uh, this afternoon with a group of seven municipalities uh, with very exotic foreign sounding names like Poughkeepsie and <laughs> Hyde Park. And they've all banded together because 100,000 people in New York, I know that doesn't sound like very much, it's like half of a neighborhood here, but 100,000 people take their drinking water directly from the Hudson every day. New York City in times of drought will take some of its water from the Hudson, but every day, of every month of every year, those people upriver take their water from the Hudson, and they have finally banded together to get the same sort of protections, land protections, infrastructure improvements, diagnostic examinations of how they're doing in protecting what goes into their water supply that New York City has enjoyed for decades. So uh, let's hear it for the rest of New York State catching up to New York City. Well, how it could is the more important question. We actually, we actually chased some of those people out of there 25 years ago. Basically, airports are terrible places to be next to watersheds because they have all sorts of chemicals that are essentially, wa essentially washed into the storm sewer. The, basically, the city of New York and the state of New York are going to have to do something about the proposal to expand Westchester Airport because they will have very bad implications for Kensico, and you obviously know that Kensico is the most important reservoir in the New York City water system because it is the receiving part of that system. So that's the last one before the water cut. All the other s systems feed into Kensico, and then, then it comes down here. Right. So, so if, you, if, you, if you protect it all the way, and then you pollute it down at Kensico, the last couple of yards, you're killing yourself. Fully, fully strategy, exactly yes. right. The, now, the, we, we've, we did some things in the 1990s to secure Kensico, but the late unlamented county executive of Westchester, who fortunately has been changed by the votes of the people, he was clearly indifferent to the, these concerns. And, we're gonna, and the city will have to do something about it and face up to that. If, well, it, if it intends to be expanded. So well, you're, you got yeah. your finger on the pearls. So I grew up right on the Kensico Reservoir uh, on the um, elegantly named Nanahagan Road. It's the place where I learned to fish. It's the place that I identify with the New York City water supply system. And it is exactly as, as important as Jim and Al have said it is. And there are two airports I want to talk about. The Westchester County Airport, uh, you need to deal with the storage of the firefighting foam, uh, and you need to deal with the storage of the ethylene glycol, and you need to reduce the impacts of those contaminants and others off-site. Uh, New York's uh, Port Authority 
uh, manages the uh, Stewart Airport, I believe, uh, up in uh, Newburgh on the other side of the river. And it has an Air National Guard base as well. They did not manage the firefighting foam. And for 20 years, the people of Newburgh, 30,000 people were drinking poisoned water because of the PFOF, PFOS contaminant that was coming out of the leaking tanks for the firefighting foam. And now Newburgh is on city water, at least temporarily, while the state of New York has had to build a $70 million filtration system for that water supply. So uh, when I was with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, Al's right, we didn't always get it right, but there were 4,200 of us working to get it right with a smaller population and absolutely no consciousness of climate change 4,200 people in 1990, and in the year of uh, our Lord, 2018, that 4,200 has become 2,800. So we need to rebuild our capacity to enforce our laws to keep what's in these airports that we depend on from leaking out into the water that we depend on. Right, and this is not the, these are not the only airports. There are airports in Long Island that have exactly the same problem. Grabowski Airport, for example, by Southampton uh, has been a huge you know, pollutant of these yeah. chemicals sinking into the groundwater. Um, I'm from Philadelphia, so many of them are taking place in, um, in Pennsylvania, in both uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Um, and they're all about introducing people to their watershed and talking also not just about making people aware of their watersheds, but also ways of um, small solutions that art can do, because art actually can do some work on the site. Um, so there should be an underline under artwork. And um, they actually, some of my projects, there's, that's the New York project, actually that was in Brooklyn and Gowanus. Um, and that's, on, that's in Gowanus too with um, NYC H2O, a, a project where we painted uh, the, the tr trace of the stream which is running under these streets as a way of making people aware painted with very temporary chalk paint. So it washed away with the rain, which I think is very poetic that the rain takes care of its own, um, but gives a sense of what's, uh, what is flowing under your grid. Um, um, yeah. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned NYCH2O, which is a great organization um, in the dealing with city water systems. You, when we, quickly, I have a question. Could you revisit conversation we had last year in which you talked about the turbulence and how those patterns repeat themselves in nature? Oh, the, well, yeah. turbulence is a, an extraordinary thing. Is this, this is on. And um, there are flows that water takes that all liquids take so that when you put cream in your coffee or almond milk and you stir it, you get the exact same hydrology that's going on in a superstorm, in a hurricane, but it's also going on in, in a puddle if you, um, if you make a, a ripple, and going on in all of our waterways, in bays and streams that are going around rocks. And they have some wonderful form. So um, part of learning about what's flowing under your street is also l learning the patterns that they flow in, because these patterns are um, part of us. And one of the reasons we love spirals, because there's a kind of spiraling a pattern that happens and historically artists have been using those patterns for a long time, probably not exactly knowing what, what they are. But one of the interesting things is Leonardo da Vinci was the um, artist who discovered, I'm sure he would like to be called a scientist, not an artist, who discovered the shape of water, what water, um, the pattern that water makes when there's a disturbance in it, which is the kind of heart shape uh, spiral that you often see if anyone's canoed that pattern that comes off of your paddle is that very key hydrological pattern that repeats in a sort of fractal way from um, in your bloodstream and how your heart works and your heart valves and in any giant hurricane storm will also have that same kind of um, uh, uh, Carmen vortex going on too. So, Okay, a few more questions? Uh, my, my question has to do with the order that came from um, Washington recently about drilling along all of the coastlines except Florida, of course. <laughs> do we have any recourse? What happens? 
Well, uh, I've been doing environmental law for a little over 30 years, and I've seen terrible proposals come, and I've seen terrible proposals go. First of all, there are not a lot of resources available um, off our coast, but we shouldn't just be thinking about our coast. This, if ever there was a plan that needed suing, it was this one. And we will be involved with our national group, the Waterkeeper Alliance, in litigation against it. And we will have to line up at the courtroom, and I expect that the line will be about 50 organizations long. So we will, we will fight them on the beaches. Uh, this is a, a bit of a grim question, but I think about it every once in a while. How easy would it be for a gang of terrorists to poison our water supply by attacking Ashokan, by attacking Kensico, uh, Croton Aqueduct, et cetera, and having the city maybe be evacuated because the water supply is poisoned? We, we actually looked at that at some length. Um, you know, there, there were the talks about putting LSD in the water supply. The city- <laughs> That the, seems like a good idea now. <laughs> The amount of water the city of New York uses makes it very difficult to envision somebody kind of just pouring a jug of stuff in the water. You'd have to back up a few tanker trucks, um, very big tanker trucks. And most of, <clears throat> most of the potential chemical pollutants, I mean, there's some ways you could attack the, the system, but I never actually talk about those in public. Um, the <clears throat> But the kind of the scenario of some terrorist kind of dumping stuff in the, the in the Ashokan Reservoir. Um, first of all, the city has 10,000 monitoring points, and we'd catch it pretty quickly. And second of all, um, the amount of water a billion gallons of water a day dilutes a lot of stuff. And the, the city of New York now basically uses. So, as opposed to 1.5 billion gallons a day, we use 1.50 million gallons a day of water. So that's a lot, of, that dilutes a lot of things, and we catch it. Um, as I say, we've looked at the scenario. I don't, nobody should, in the face of serious terrorism, take, be overly sanguine or overly, uh, you know, poly, um, Pollyannish, but it would, be t it would be tough to do. I, I just have a quick aside. So, as a, as a result of some of this research that we were doing in terms of the industrial waterfront's vulnerability to storm surge in the chemical clusters, we have a partnership going on with the Rand Corporation. Talk about taking LSD, man. The Rand Corporation. Anyway, so we have this study going on looking at specifically auto shops, and we went to DEP to ask, you know, we want to know, get specific you know, uh, exposures of chemicals, specific chemicals with specific industries. And we were denied, even after we used the community right to know law, uh, which means that the community has a right to know. We were rejected by DEP because of terrorist concerns. And we had a meeting because I couldn't believe it. And they were like, well, we can't let this information out because if a terrorist wanted to target one of these industrial facilities on the waterfront to contaminate the water, I said, what kind of like mad, like if you're a terrorist, there are so many other options that you have if you want to endanger people. I don't think like, you know, getting a, an auto shop's chemicals into the water of the East River is kind of like the long vision that terrorists have when it comes, so, it, so it's my little aside about how DEP takes at least some of this stuff to an uber, no pun intended, serious kind of thing about this that, that we need to have access to some of this information and we can't get it because of security concerns. So uh, I, I think we're going to uh, wrap it up now. And I, I want to say that there's a library that contains uh, both some warnings from the past, but hope as well. And it's a, a sedimentary library. It's the sediment in the Central Park Lake. And it was tested some years back. They went down and took layers. And what they found was lead levels, decade by decade, very much in keeping with what was happening in the city in terms of industrial pollution and also residential pollution. We were incinerating our garbage, apartment houses all over New York. Everyone was just burning their garbage. When I was a kid, I remember the, the stuff coming down. Uh, and. That's not happening anymore. And that record is one 
uh, you know, once they got up towards the top layers of that sediment, there wasn't lead in it anymore. So things can turn around and change, but you got to keep an eye on them. So thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.